Way back in the 1950s, the American auto industry was obsessed with creating cars that were longer, lower, and wider than the competitions. The classic American automobile was big on chrome. In fact, it was big on everything. Auto racing was slowly evolving into a major league sport, and hoping to cash in on this emerging interest in the mid-50s, Chrysler was the first auto builder to create anything resembling a real performance sedan with its Chrysler 300 series. But over at Pontiac, their chrome-laden lineup hadn't really taken the performance market by storm. Enter Bunky Knudsen, who after becoming head man at Pontiac in the 50s, parlayed his fondness for racing into a new direction at Pontiac. As the 50s ended, Pontiacs were showing up more and more at oval tracks and drag strips and winning. But in 1963, GM pulled the plug on racing with its now famous corporate racing ban. The Pontiac Brain Trust had a dilemma. With Pontiac sales surging upward on its performance identity, the racing ban presented a real problem. John Z. DeLorean was Pontiac's chief engineer while all this was happening. And after the compact Pontiac Tempest had struggled in its first three years of production, a fresh restyle for 1964 would help somewhat. But DeLorean and his team of engineers had been playing around with the idea of dropping Pontiac's torque-heavy 389 cube engine into the Tempest, and they thought maybe it was time to do it. The car had been developed and was in service, but purely as kind of a private project, you know, from a bunch of exciting engineers, when the idea, from a marketing point of view, that this car could fill a couple of real serious voids suddenly was exposed. And the combination of those two things is what led to the decision to get that car into the marketplace, whatever. <laughs> the Pontiac team had to perform a little sleight of hand to get this wild creation past the corporate watchdogs. And what you had to do was go to your dealer and order a Le Mans Sport Coupe. And then down in the lower right-hand corner of the order form was a little box labeled GTO Option. And then away at the end of that list was... 389 cubic inch engine. <laughs> the new car was called the Pontiac Tempest GTO, and the muscle car had been born. The GTO was an unqualified home run. After intending to build only 5,000 as a one-time special edition, the tidal wave of orders that rumbled in from Pontiac dealers convinced GM to build 32,000 in 1964. The GTO had set off a horsepower fusillade among the big three that saw new performance cars rolling from assembly lines on an almost daily basis. The Pontiac GTO became more than a car. It was a cultural fingerprint of the era of Motown muscle. What we did, it's terrible to say it this way, but in a sense what we were proposing to do was to take performance off the track and put it on the street. The GTO was unquestionably the number one cover car for enthusiast magazines from coast to coast. The song GTO by Ronnie and the Daytonas sold over a million copies. The Monkey Mobile was based on a 1966 GTO. And back at Pontiac, something called brand management was affecting the bottom line on other Pontiac models. And very soon what had happened is that the Bonneville was the GTO of the big sedan market. The Grand Prix was the GTO of the luxury sport market. Even the Catalina was kind of a GTO in the popularly priced family sedan market. And it, it worked for the entire line of cars. Through the middle and late 60s, the GTO would go through some styling and powertrain changes. The most dramatic, the 1969 GTO Judge, with its eye-slashing paint and ram air engines. But as we now all know, the muscle car era that the GTO had ignited in 1964 met with the stark realities of emissions regulations, more stringent safety mandates, and an oil embargo or two as the 1970s began. By 1974, the final year of the GTO, it had been emasculated to essentially a rebadged Chevy Nova with a relatively tame 350 cube engine. Along with the energy crisis, which showed up in the fourth quarter of 73, really the first quarter for the Detroit automakers, that really spelled the end. In the mid-year 74, they dropped the pain plate and buried it, to really never to bring it back again. It will always be remembered as the car that invented an entire generation of Detroit hot rods. And to men like Jim Wangers, who were part of that era, it was indeed a time we shall never see again. <laughs>